live now in five, four, three, two, Welcome to Janet's Planet, where we're traveling at the speed of thought. And boy, oh boy, are we excited today because we are talking spacesuits with Dr. Ryan Kobrick. He's going to talk about what we need as an astronaut. He's going to amaze and wow us with the possibility of being an astronaut. And again, so everybody suit up and let's get ready for Dr. Ryan Kobrick. Welcome, Ryan. Hi, I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, lots of friendly faces here this morning, and you guys all look excited. Are you guys excited to talk about spacesuits and maybe fake Mars? Like, how do you simulate Mars a little bit? Cool. Well, I'm looking forward to sharing all those things with you. Um, I kind of have two parts today. I'm going to share my screen in just a moment. Um, but if you have questions, uh, feel free to kind of just, you know, pop up your hand in the chat, or, um, you know, if you can, you can stop me. Don't feel you know, perfectly fine to stop me and say, hey, I got a question. Can you hold on a second? Because that's going to help a lot. That's going to help everyone because maybe someone else had the same question, um, but they you got to it first kind of thing. So without further ado, what I'm going to do is share my screen. Um, I prepared. It's a lot of slides, but it's mostly photos because I wanted to share lots of photos with you guys. Um, let me just rearrange my um, my toolbar here. There's a lot of pop ups all over the place, right? So the one thing I can't see is the chat room at the same time as presenting the PowerPoint slides because there's a bunch of images here. So what so, I will do yep. for you, Ryan, is anything that I see, because I'll still be able to see that, yep. I will, I may go, hey, Ryan, I got a question. Perfect. Okay. So um, happy to be here. So spacesuit up is the talk because we're mostly talking about spacesuits. Um, hi, my name is Ryan. I'm fine with everyone. Just call me Ryan. That's fine. You're you, whatever you're comfortable with. And um, I've been involved with the space industry for quite some time. We'll just call it X years. Um, and I don't know if you can see in the background there, can you tell what's going on in that photo? Um, not sure if you can or not. So let's, uh, let's make it a little bit clear. What about now? Does this look like uh, Mars, maybe, with the orange sky? Uh, well, it's kind of Mars. It's more of a, a, what you could call a fake Mars or a simulated Mars. This is where, this is actually on Devon Island in the Canadian Arctic, that's 75 degrees north. That's pretty much right, it's near the actual magnetic North Pole, but it's pretty getting pretty close to that North Pole. It's really cold up there, um, very barren. Um, it's one of the largest uninhabited islands on the Earth, or it is the largest uninhabited island on the Earth. Um, so the two things I'm gonna talk to you guys about today are spacesuits and space analogs. So I'm gonna see if I can just Toggle, I can toggle my view a bit here so I can at least see some of the uh, faces in the, um, in the oh, sure. uh, gallery view. And then oh, totally. I can, so I can see, I'll see whoever kind of pops to the top. So that way Janet can like do the, the wave, the high, the sign like, hey, stop. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> sure. I, I know it's on my slides. I've seen them a few times. So, um, so let's talk about spacesuits. Spacesuits uh, are cool, right? This is uh, really what's uh, inspired me in my career in space is just like seeing this, everything you need to survive in the harsh environment of space is right there in that one little tiny spacecraft. Um, all the things that a uh, human would need for, although it, it won't last all the time, it'll last only like eight or nine hours, um, is somewhere in that spacesuit system to protect that person. Um, so there they are. This is actually Bruce McCandless flying, free floating in space, testing out what was called the MMU. It was the first time they actually test out this full, almost like a jet pack in space um, so that the astronaut could actually return back to the space shuttle or the space station they were working on safely. And this actually got modified into a small piece of equipment called the SAFER, which is an acronym, of course. Um, and the SAFER is part of their life support system that's on their backpack, just in case so something goes I wrong. I love acronyms. What does yeah. SAFER stand for? Oh no, I'm getting tested. Um, <laughs> I would have to check. It's like the safe uh, astronaut. Uh, but you know what? I just check things. You know, when you're not sure an answer to a question, it's okay to look it up. Um, it is the simplified aid for EVA rescue. And EVA is an acronym. So EVA is the extravehicular activity, meaning anytime you leave your vehicle, you're on EVA. So it's actually an acronym in an acronym. So Oh, even better. Yeah, it's a super acronym. Um, 
so this is like, this is it. Like I could spend the whole time on this one photo, but you guys want to see more photos, right? So let's look at more stuff. Um, so I've been inspired by sci-fi as well. Um, not just sci-fi, but even art created by people like NASA and other artists around the world. Um, so here's a famous book, Have Spacesuit Will Travel by Robert Heinlein. Uh, at the very bottom there, that's not, that's actually a real test. They're actually testing to see how far the astronauts' arms can actually move to see if they can push the right buttons when they're in their pressurized suit. And that actually inspired a lot of the work that we've done in our lab. Um, I work at a university called Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. And on campus, we actually have a spacesuit lab. And that's the t-shirt I'm wearing. And you'll see that logo over and over, the little eagle with the helmet on, because we're the eagles. Um, so I've been very fortunate enough to uh, test lots of spacesuits. Um, I've been part of all these uh, Mars simulations all over the world. This is another photo of the Arctic. This is, uh, again, Devon Island. Um, and the reason we went there is because that's actually an impact crater. And so I'm on the rim of the crater. And the reason you go to an impact crater is that when something large hits the surface of any planet, it actually exposes the layers of the history of the planet. And so you can see all the different layers and you can learn about how the planet was formed or what happened to the planet over time or what happened to the solar system. And so there's a lot of science that you would do in those field locations. On the right there, there's a couple more spacesuits. On the top right is actually a real spacesuit under development by Final Frontier Design. You'll see that spacesuit um, a bunch of times in these slides. And then in the bottom right is actually a simulated spacesuit at the Mars Desert Research Station, um, where I guess that was two years ago, the last time I did one of these simulations. The longest one, by the way, in the Arctic, it was a four month mission. So we were doing 100 days of Mars simulation, where if we went outside, we had to wear a spacesuit. And we'll talk about that in the analog part of this of chit chat. So I love spacesuits. Uh, you can see this photo in the, my background and my camera right now. It's actually in Huntsville, Alabama and um, in their education center. Uh, those are Apollo suits behind glass. And then the glass is reflecting the Saturn V. You can see the USA up in the top part of the picture. So it's just, I love, I, like, I love photography. Um, that's kind of one of my, I guess you could say, uh, art outlets. Um, so anyway, I love spacesuits. I love taking pictures of spacesuits. Uh, so this is kind of on the science side. I wanted to do some science with you guys in terms of how do you design a spacesuit. So to design a spacesuit, there's really three fundamental things it has to do. So number one, what do you, I mean, I was about to ask, what do you guys think? But it's right in front of you. Um, you have to keep the person alive, right? No matter what, you know, your spacesuit, just say it has to activate. Um, it needs to keep them safe. It needs to keep them alive. Okay, great. So they're alive. So what's the next level that you need to be able to do? Well, they have to be able to function, meaning they need to be able to actually either push buttons, you know, fix things that are broken, uh, put on their seatbelt. Like what if they're floating around? They, they can't just float around in their spacesuit inside the spacecraft. They need to actually get in their seat if they're coming back to Earth. Um, and then finally, if at all possible, and this is the big hard part for spacesuit design, is that it should be comfortable. Um, so you don't want it, you want it to be able to do its job, but you also want it to be comfortable. So um, if any of you guys, does anyone play, um, I play hockey. So I, everything to me is hockey, right? All my things that I think about are hockey, hockey, hockey or space, space, space. I don't know if anyone plays hockey or a sport that has a lot of equipment on you. Um, and just think about how um, obviously it needs to protect you. And then it needs to be, you need to be able to function to skate, run, move. Um, and then you want it to be comfortable, right? You don't want this thing to be like, you know, rubbing on your shoulder or, uh, you know, interfering with your ability to see where you're going. Um, so you really want it to be comfortable as well as being able to work. Okay, everyone good with that so far? That's kind of like the most important thing you can know about designing anything to do with humans in space. So the next kind of level, uh, there's actually a video. I'm not gonna play the video, but there's a link there because I think it's actually safe for all ages, but it's a clip from Doctor Who, um, one of the more recent Doctor Whos, and he talks about surviving in space. And this is a, there's a lot of information on this graphic, but I wanted you guys to know about this kind of rule of threes, because that's really important for understanding how do you survive um, and how do you live and work in space, and there, therefore, how do you design a spacesuit? So you need pressure, first of all. So without pressure in three seconds, you'll start to have physiological problems, like. It's not good, trust me. Um, and then the other threes in the top right corner, you can see there, you can actually go three minutes without air or without oxygen. 
Um, obviously that's not good. You don't wanna ever be exposed to that. You can go three hours without shelter in extreme conditions. So if you're to say, I don't know, in a hurricane or something wild like that, or in the sun, like super hot sun in the desert, um, you would survive, but eventually you would need shelter. Uh, I know a bunch of you play Minecraft, right? So what happens if you don't have a shelter in Minecraft? Well, you guys are the experts, you tell me. Um, it's, it's not good, right? So the next big thing is you can actually go three days without water. Uh, water, oh, as yeah. Brian, I have such a great question. Yeah, uh, well, I need actually, water right now. <laughs> so several, couple of really great ones. Uh, okay. From Dharma, what is the average cost for a spacesuit? And yeah. then from Jennifer Wagaman, how heavy is a spacesuit? Awesome questions. Let's answer them right now. Um, so the cost um, is, okay, so the, the, this is something that's kind of, uh, it depends kind of answer, because if it's a spacesuit for just inside the spacecraft, which is called an IVA, intravehicular activity suit, that means just wearing it to be launched in. Um, so you have like a fireproof emergency gas bubble, if you will. Um, those cost like 100,000 to $200,000. And so that's something that a lot of designers are trying to uh, make lower. A lot of people are trying to create new spacesuits to be much lower cost than that. For the ones that walk in space, like in microgravity or on the moon, just to remake one would cost something like 20, 10 to $20 million to make. Um, but to what? develop it for the first time would cost $100 million because there's so much development that's needed to make it safe. Uh, it, you have to think about all the different things that are all the different parts of that space. So you have to be super clean, like all the oxygen uh, piping, all the water piping for cooling the astronaut. Um, you can't just put any water, tap water in there. It's gotta be you know, uh, water that can be filtered, cleaned and everything else. Um, so they're super, super expensive. Um, the second question was about how heavy are they? So again, it depends on if it's an IVA or EVA suit. So that's the big thing, right? IVA or EVA, so inside or outside. So the IVA ones are usually like 30 pounds. Most of the weight is actually gonna be in the helmet. Um, if they have a helmet, the helmets are really heavy. The rest of it is kind of um, like putting on, if any of you have ever worn like a dry suit or a wetsuit, um, you know, it's pretty bulky, but it's not too heavy. The ones in space though, the moonwalking ones were almost 300 pounds um, but keep in mind they're in microgravity when they're in space or they're in one sixth gravity if they're on the moon. And if they went to Mars, it would be one third gravity. Um, so it reduces how much you're wearing. So overall, the best way to think about this is, okay, what do we know as humans as a safe amount of weight that someone can carry? And we know that um, for the most part, it's something like 50 pounds on earth. Um, and if there, there are actually standards and everything else to keep people safe, like even OSHA standards on what a working person should wear and for how long. Um, so those are great questions. So just the final part on the slide here is you can actually go three weeks without food. Not that anybody would ever want to experience that. Um, that's really hard, um, but it, you will survive. Okay, so this is another like very sciencey chart, but I thought it was worth sharing. This actually shows the human body as a cartoon and all the things that you need, the inputs and all the things that come out of your body, the outputs. So you really need three key things. You need water, you need food, um, which are energy, which you know, it becomes energy, and you need potable water, which means drinkable water. And you need about four liters per day. So that's a lot. Um, and uh, this is all in metric, by the way. Uh, I know that we've got a mixed crowd. Um, so just so you know, one kilogram is 2.2 pounds. So you could just double some of these numbers and you would get it. So instead of one uh, kilogram, you would need two pounds of, um, of oxygen. So, um, and then all the things that come out of you, you've got gases, obviously. So does anyone have a guess how much oxygen there is in the air? Like what's the percentage of oxygen that we breathe in? How much of this, like if I were to make a little ball right in front of me, how much of that is actually oxygen? You know what, that's such a great question. Uh, anybody who's got, okay, so uh, Jennifer says 15%. Anybody else wanna okay. put in the chat how much they think? Uh, Alexander says 21%. Uh -huh. Anybody else got a good guess out there? Oh, uh, Ander says 30%. Rory says 10%. Judah says 25%. 
guys are getting it. So yeah, so 21% um, on earth, of course, is the, uh, our standard. It's what we, our bodies uh, adapted to. Um, even if you were living at sea level, or even if you're living in the mountains, it's still 21%. So, and we can talk about gas all day, right? Everyone can talk about gas. That's the easiest thing to talk about is who's gassy, right? So 21% comes in, but when you breathe it out, it actually, there's still like 15 or 16%. There's still oxygen when you breathe out because your lungs aren't processing all of it. It just, it takes a bit of it. And so you do actually breathe out oxygen, you breathe out, but it can be used again. But things that you can't really use again is carbon dioxide. So the trees can use that, but humans really need to get that out of their spacesuit. And so you actually make things that filter the CO2 to get rid of that carbon dioxide. Um, you of course have waste, uh, liquid and solid waste. Um, and you sweat and you have uh, actually, there's humidity in your breath too. So this is, the, that's a, a fun thing to play with is to look at all the things the body needs. And of course there's money because we just talked about it. So I'm glad we had the question. So um, money is not really a consumable, if you will, for the body, but it is something that you need if you want to design a spacesuit. Okay, one last crazy chart. These are, this is what it would look like if you were to map out all the different inputs and outputs of a human to all the different systems that make a spacesuit. So you've got power for things like fans and pumps, you've got communications so you can talk to ground control or mission support or whoever you're talking to. Um, you've got some propulsion that we mentioned the safer. Thermal is a big one because it's so extreme. You've got negative 250 to plus 250 Fahrenheit, depending on if you're in the sun or the shade when you're in low earth orbit. And so this is what it looks like when you start mapping how all these pieces need to connect. Um, so it's a big deal to like connect a suit. So the last thing really for the spacesuits is the human side of it is that you need the right person obviously to wear the right suit. So I love NASA's hashtag right now. They used it last time for the astronaut selection call was be an astronaut. And I think that's perfect. And we can all, for all, if we could all just be an astronaut, these superhumans um, and uh, make the world a better place. So uh, wrong way. So uh, a little bit about current spacesuits because I definitely wanna make sure you know what's flying right now. So there's actually two different EVA spacesuits. You can see on my slide at the bottom, it says EVA. Um, one is actually the US built one and the other one is the Russian built one. So the EMU, another acronym, the Extravehicular Mobility Unit um, is their EVA suit. And you've probably seen lots of photos of that one, right? The white suit that actually was first used uh, the, the parts of it were first used in Apollo and they kept upgrading it and upgrading it for all the different missions. The one big thing to keep in mind here though is they're floating around in space. You cannot walk on the surface of the moon or Mars with that particular spacesuit, only with parts of it. So this is fine for zero G, but if you wanna be able to walk, you need, you need legs that can enable you to actually walk. And so NASA is actually working on something called the X EMU. X for exploration. And uh, that's gonna change the insides of the spacesuits. The, it's called the hard upper torso where everything mounts to. It's kind of like your, uh, if you're doing Lego, cause I love Lego, it's like the base plate, right? It's like everything connects to it and keeps it stable. Um, and then, so in the middle, we have the Orlon suit for, from the Russians. It's a little bit different because it's, in, it's all one piece. You actually open it up from the back and you climb into it. Um, and then finally on the right is the IVA suit. So that's what they launch in and what they come home in. It's the Sokol Russian suit. And uh, we've had lots of different versions of this in the US uh, for various programs. But right now we're only launching humans from Kazakhstan with the Russian partnership. And very soon, hopefully like this year, we'll be launching Americans from American soil and American spacecraft again. And it's been uh, nine years. So I guess just quick show of hands, how many of you are, are nine years or younger? Who's, who's younger than nine? I see a bunch of hands. That means you've never seen Americans launch from the US before. And to people like me who are uh, X years old, um, that's, that's pretty wild to think about because I remember being at the last three space shuttle launches um, only nine years ago. Um, so I'm, I hope you're excited because it's like almost next door and I'm sure Disney's excited too, because that means that they'll probably be like, oh, they're going to come for a launch and come to Disney, right? <laughs> but, uh, 
So Florida's excited. Um, and I worked for the whole state of Florida uh, before I became a professor. And it was very exciting to get people involved in space. So more spacesuits. Let's look at more pictures of spacesuits, mm -hmm. real ones. So this is the EMU, the cartoon of it and a real photo of it on the right. Um, and it just talks more about it. So I'll share the PDF of my presentation later so you can look at this in more detail. But you can also search for these online. And it gives you some information about all the layers that they need, all the buttons and valves and everything. And you'll notice that the on the display control thing, it's not the Darth Vader box thingy, which my students sometimes joke about, um, is that it's actually backwards. They actually use a mirror on their arm and they look at some of the controls with that mirror. So they can't even see their own controls. So it's, it's so complicated that they can't even do that. Um, and they can only change a few things. Otherwise, mission control can help them. Okay, let's keep moving. They got a lot to share. So, um, <laughs> and, and more importantly, I want to do more Q and A, especially at the end. So, uh, let's. I'm not going to go too fast, but I'll go a little bit faster. So, these are spacesuits under development. On the far left is the Exploration EMU, the X EMU. That one's going to be. That's what they want to design to be the Moonwalker. That's just the concept um, color outer layer. It was just uh, something they designed to be fun and you know be um, U.S. flaggy. Um, and then on the right are actually three different spacesuits that are meant for, excuse me, inside the vehicle. So IVA, the intravehicular activity suits, they're just for launching and coming home or for an emergency abort scenario. And you've got the SpaceX suit, which is the white one with the gray. You've got the Boeing blue suit, um, which is the, the blue one. Um, and you've got the Orion exploration suit or the OX on the far right. And actually the one on the, the blue one and the orange one are made by the same company. They're made by David Clark company. And they're very different because they had different requirements that the spacecraft, the people that are building the spacecraft wanted. So the blue one, look at the, hel look at the helmet. The helmet's actually soft. It's like a bubble helmet with like a plastic shield. It actually folds down with the zipper at the neck. And that's very much like a dry suit, that seal, that zipper. Um, but on the right, they're wearing a full like crash helmet. Like a, that's like the, David Clark actually makes headsets and they've made the same helmet for many, many, many spacesuits. And so this is from the heritage of what they've built before. So that's going to fly in the Orion, the Lockheed Martin vehicle. And Ryan, we've got a yeah. question from Jennifer. If okay. we stay on these spacesuits, what are these things made of? And do you, I, I've got a weird question, like why would you make that? I mean, I can see that it's like for uh, yeah. ease making that blue suit, you know, unzippable. But then I go, what happens to your cr crack your cranium or something? But talk yeah. about some of the materials that might be used in this stuff. Sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, there's a couple major, especially, let me just, let's just concentrate on the ones you wear inside the spacecraft for launching. Um, there's a couple things you want them to be able to do. Number one, they have to be able to hold pressure. So if you had a balloon and just say the spacesuit essentially is a balloon and you were to blow up that balloon, if I had a balloon, I would do that. And you squeeze one end of the balloon, what happens? The other one kind of like bulges out, right? So in order to prevent that happening and keeping this kind of volume where you can move around in, they actually have a restraint layer. And so those are two very important layers. One being the pressure layer, kind of like a balloon bladder, like something that can keep the air in and a restraint layer, which is called usually called link net because it's actually like overlaps like a web of mesh and it holds the pressure of it down and keeps it from expanding out in weird bubbles. And so those are two major layers. Then the external layers, what's really important is fire protection. And so a lot of them are materials, Nomex, um, things like that, that are able to handle uh, if there was an emergency fire or something uh, to give the astronauts enough time to be safe to like maybe vent it into space by and keeping the pressure on the inside of the suit and venting the, the cabin or something. So that's a very basic kind of overview. There's lots of layers though. If you go, we'll just kind of cover it now, but if you were to go outside now on EVA, um, you've got really three to four major differences. One is the thermal environment. It's really, really hot or really, really cold. And so you're not safe inside your spacecraft anymore. So you actually need to have a cooling loop on the body to keep to get the heat away from you. Um, and you also have to have layering to help reflect the sun. Um, you have to deal with radiation because you don't have the spaceship protecting you. And so you're able to protect yourself from radiation. Um, the third one is micrometeorites. Like these things are little teeny rocks flying all over the place. Um, and so you need to have a layer that's essentially bulletproof. And so that material is actually Kevlar. Kevlar is bulletproof. 
Um, and so these, all these layers, you have, sometimes you have 17 layers on one spot of the spacesuit. So it's, it just depends on where on the spacesuit it is. Uh, the last one is dust protection. So if you're on the moon, uh, possibly even Mars issues, but more for the moon, is you really wanna make sure that the dust doesn't get into all the moving parts because the dust, so I want you to think about this for a bit. We've got the moon, it's floating in space. And if I am not in my office, I'm at home, so I don't have all like cool little toys that I can play with, but you can pretend my hand's a moon. Uh, and there's no atmosphere and there, it's a vacuum. And so micrometeorites are hitting it from every angle over you know 4.5 billion years of hitting it. But then there's no wind. There's no water. There's nothing to move those particles. They just sit there. So on the moon, all the dust is essentially broken glass. All the dust on the moon is as sharp as glass. Um, so if you think about like, um, if you go to the beach, um, everything is nice and rounded because the water and the wind have moved it and rolled it and made it smooth. It's like sanding it, sanding the sand. <laughs> uh, but on the moon, it's really sharp. And so those sharp particles got into all the astronauts' spacesuits and all over the place and caused a lot of damage. They scratched the visors, they had trouble seeing. They, they scratched all their, their gadgets, their dials and things, so they couldn't actually read some of their things. Um, so it's a very dangerous environment. So dust is very important to design for, for an EVA suit on the moon. And for Mars, there is some weathering because there is 1% atmosphere, so things move. Um, and because they move, they kind of get rounded out, but it's still a concern because there's a lot of it. And it's like, you know, if you come back from the beach, because I'm in Florida, so I think about the beach and I haven't been there in a month. Um, you bring all your sand home with you. And so it ends up everywhere in your car and at home and you have to clean it up. So this is like that, except for it actually sticks to you. So it's a lot worse. <laughs> hey, Dr. Ryan, we've got a couple of uh, questions. One from Facebook online, okay. uh, Rosa Luisa uh, asks, would suits affect the ecosystem of another planet? Do they release anything into the atmosphere? Sure. And so that's one question. And then Jack wants to know, has anyone ever floated into space without a spacesuit? Or has anyone ever tried out the thinner spacesuit in space? Okay, awesome questions. Let's see, let's start with the first. Um, that's a very important question to ask because we don't want to uh, have cross planetary contamination. So uh, one thing to think about is if you went to Mars and your spacesuit was um, to say off gassing some water or something, or maybe your sweat, which has microbes in it. And then you try to use your, your fancy life detection equipment and you think you detect life, but you've only detected your own sweat. So we really don't want any of that stuff to get out. Um, the other major thing is, is that it's actually, you want to, uh, you don't want to any, any of the consumables that you are required for maintaining a spacesuit. So ideal, ideally you track like every single molecule, nothing leaves, right? It's a closed system. That's the, that's the goal of a spacesuit is to make it a closed system. And so um, I want to say, you know, hopefully in the future we have spacesuits, especially hopefully we're have humans on Mars um, that are able to use spacesuits and that we have them able to be more of a closed system. On the moon, however, they actually off-gas uh, water. They actually use a, what's called a sublimator. Um, that means that the, um, the heat that's taken away from the body actually goes onto the, the back of the life support system. And uh, the heat then creates actually an ice buildup and the ice goes directly from ice to gas, it vents away. And they use that also in space. So right now we would be affecting the direct environment um, but if they can, you know, if you happen to catch those molecules, water is like, water is like the gold of the moon. Like you want all the water. So you don't want to lose that water. So it is something we have to think about um, in future design is how do we prevent any kind of um, loss like that? Um, the other question about no, no one's gone like, uh, I guess you could say naked in space uh, without a spacesuit. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that would be the end of them. Cause there's the thing is, even though you would survive just say three seconds without pressure, like just say you, you flew from one airlock to the other real quickly. And then there's magically there's pressure again. Um, you still damage the body on in that process. So you are alive, but things are going bad really quickly. Um, I don't think anyone's ever tested an IVA suit that was designed for only IVA in space. Um, However, there have been lots of spacesuits that have done both. Um, so if you think back in history to Gemini, um, the very first spacesuits, they actually were designed for both inside and outside. 
the capsule, and the same with the Apollo suits. Apollo's, Apollo suits are actually three in one because they're the launch, uh, the IVA launch entry abort suit, which we see on the in the photo here. They're also the EVA spacesuit for on the surface, um, and they're also the zero G EVA spacesuit. So the zero G and a surface EVA, like we mentioned, you need legs for one, you don't need legs for the other. They used it. They actually did the deep space EVAs on the Apollo mission on the way back from the moon. And so they, um, you know, that's kind of like the the best design if you can if you can incorporate all those things. It gets heavy. It gets expensive. Um, one of the reasons why you'd want one of these lightweight suits is that after you've launched, you can pack it up into a little ball and put it away, and it's out of the way, and it doesn't weigh a lot. So the more the heavier things are, uh, the more it costs to actually launch them into space. Okay. And um, here, here's yeah. a couple of questions too. And guys, okay. I hope you're taking notes. This is so important. So. IVA, which is for mm -hmm. inside uh, the yep. vehicle. EVA is for outside. I mean, when you think about, it, it's like, I mean, those Apollo suits weighed what? Probably two to 300 pounds if you yep. were holding them on earth. Here is a question. Somebody, uh, Jack wants to know has anyone ever died in space? There were some animals who didn't survive uh, yeah. when they were launched. Uh, and then there's one other question. Has there ever been a spacesuit malfunction? Now we can, if you want to talk a little bit about what happened to a couple of the visors for the astronauts, yeah. but has There's anyone been, died and the visor? Yeah. So um, yeah, definitely uh, a lot of important questions to ask. So um, in space, there have been a number of accidents and um, most of them have been, I guess you could say on the way to or on the way back from space. Um, for the US, there's been, the major accidents have included Apollo 1, which was a fire on the launch pad, um, where they were wearing spacesuits, but it was more of a, um, a systems problem with the hatch and how much flammable material they had and frayed wiring. Um, the, and then there were two space shuttle accidents. One was as Challenger, as it was launching, um, had a problem with the uh, solids in the uh, external tank. They had the solids actually were venting into the liquid tank and caused an explosion. Um, venting fire, not like venting, but like the flame. Uh, and then STS-107, uh, which is Columbia, coming back from Earth, uh, it actually had its accident on launch as well, where a hole was made in the wing, and as it came back and it re-entered, it actually broke apart. So even if they had, I mean, if they had super, like, Iron Man suits, maybe they would have survived, but uh, they were probably not likely. And then there's actually been a few accidents in Russia, uh, Soyuz 1 and Soyuz 11, and so... Um, the one of them could have been they were not wearing spacesuits and they had a depressurization. So if they were wearing spacesuits, they they would have survived, probably survived that accident. So um, we've learned our lesson a bunch of times where spacesuits might have helped. Actually, in the um, Challenger explosion, uh, they were not wearing spacesuits. They were just wearing kind of like a blue jumper and a helmet, like kind of like a motorcycle helmet, again to protect their noggin from getting bounced around because it's pretty, it's a lot of vibration when you launch. And so uh, those are some major things that have happened uh, in the history of spaceflight. Um, so yeah, that's unfortunate, but it's really important to be aware of those things. Um, the, um, so what was the second part of the, the second question, I should say, topic? Yeah, yeah so uh, a suit malfunction. Yeah. Or okay. how, would it, how do yeah. astronauts deal with that when those things yeah. happen? One of the things sure. I'll just add of everything that we've heard and we'll hear from another astronaut on Friday, astronaut Hoot Gibson, okay. remember that everything we're hearing from these folks, whether it's Dr. Kobrick, and I can't wait for you to talk about maybe something that happened on one of your analogs, is <laughs> also to talk about the fact that go to Rudyard Kipling's poem, if you can keep your head while all about you is losing theirs, you are ahead of yeah. the game and most likely uh, able to do this. You will hear like in Apollo 13 when all manner of things were going wonky and wrong, they were able to in those 1700 pages of text that they finally printed out. Everybody was using an economy of words. Everybody knew that everyone was working really hard as a team. So I think those are the greatest lessons we can learn here about astronauts in this pursuit is that yeah. there is collaboration and there is a great deal of self-containment where we're not run by emotions, but we are going, yep, there's a problem. 
we're going to work on it. Let me see what I've got to do. Would you say that's true, Dr. Ryan? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I just realized that uh, I think we're going to have to do this in two parts and do the analog part some other time because there's so many good questions about spacesuits that it yep. might be, I don't want to rush the other stuff. We're like, I think we're, I was just looking real quick and we're like, maybe one third through all the pictures. And so <laughs> you, we is, will gladly yeah. have you back. We'll do whatever okay. you want to do. So I could, I could talk about any of these for, uh, you know, and I don't want to rush the other stuff either. So why don't we take a look at the last few things and then we can go right to chatting more um, instead of, you know, just me presenting. Cause I think that's more engaging for all of us to sure. do that. Um, so let's look at a few more pictures. Oh, I do want to answer the question. Um, and we can come back to that because there are, there is more to it, but um, actually, Luca Parmitano from uh, the European Space Agency had a leak inside of his spacesuit, inside the EMU. Here's the EMU. The, there's a liquid cooling garment on the inside, and it make it circulates water. And this is like enough tubing to cover like a tennis tennis court. Like this is a lot of tubing. Um, and it um, it uh, actually started leaking over the back of his head, and it got into his eyes, and he couldn't see. And it was slowly getting closer and closer to his mouth. And during this time, he was working with uh, his fellow crewmate on EVA and with the, his support inside the space station and also mission control back in Houston. And they were getting him back to the airlock. And by the time they got him to the airlock, it was basically almost in his mouth and they were able to get the helmet off, get the water off of him, but he could have almost drowned in space. Um, it's really hard to swallow. It's not like you could just drink that water um, away and make it disappear. Uh, and so there have there has been another spacesuit leak since then. Um, so this this equipment, you know, it needs an upgrade. It's amazing, but it needs an upgrade eventually. Um, and so that's one one thing of parts failing. Uh, another thing is that we I kind of mentioned the Apollo stuff where uh, visors got scratched and everything else. And I actually think the best thing to do is to show you a photo. So I might skip to that photo. Um, let me just see if I could skip to it easily now, or maybe we'll just, we'll just come back to it in a second. I wonder if I do this. Let's just try it. Let's, I like to experiment, right? Let's experiment with this thing. That's what good scientists do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm just gonna have to go prepare to fast forward. Fast forwarding. Okay. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Lots of space. It's right. Oh, it's kind of like slow, even on my computer. I think it just stalled. It, there's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> That's okay. We're getting a chance to sort of see some yeah. things. Sure. Have you so done one of yeah. those? Have you done one of those underwater um, kind of exercises? Yeah, I'll show you. Um, uh, I'll go back to the photo before this. Something I do with my students actually on a study abroad program in Greece. Um, so look how dirty this astronaut is. This is Apollo 17. That's astronaut Jack Schmidt. He's the only scientist to ever flown to the moon. He's a geologist. Uh, he's taking some rock samples there, and I think that might be the third EVA. Uh, he's completely covered in dust. The du his spacesuit is supposed to be white. Um, and not only is it like getting into all the cracks, and it's actually getting a little bit um, through the materials and scratching things, um, but it's actually changing the thermal properties because it's not like, you know, if you guys are aware of how sunlight reflects off of white and it gets absorbed by dark colors, well, this is actually impacting the thermal Side, like the temperature of his of his suit as well. Um, so that's that gives you an idea of what kind of uh, it looked like on the moon in terms of it's almost like working in like a dirty coal mine. And so for future spacesuits, we have to be ready to be in this kind of um, dirty, dusty environment. And so that's actually what I spent a lot of time doing my research in. My PhD is actually focused on lunar dust abrasion, meaning how does the dust rip apart things? It's kind of like sandpaper, if you think of it that way. How does the dust do that to all these different materials? So we'll come back to that again um, if uh, you because want. I think food. that's a real key thing, whether it's the moon as the moon regolith of sandpaper or Martian yeah. dust with uh, rusty, you know, kind of iron oxide yeah. in there that's harmful to a thyroid and the endocrine system of an astronaut potentially. Um, there is something strapped to the leg of the orange suit. So Evie and Maggie want to know what that is and how hot is it inside a space suit? Well, uh, two great questions. Why don't we come back to the hot part in a second here? Are they okay. talking about the underwater one of what's strapped to it? Or? or I don't know exactly. We might, when it's we go orange, live, though. we can ask yeah. if there was an orange okay. one. Let me go, let's, let's go backwards and we can do the questions. So I'll, I'll wrap up the last few slides that I have for you sure. guys on suits. 
Um, prepare to rewind. Rewind. Ah. Um, it's it's uh, it's going. If there's videos uh, that are loading and unloading, <laughs> so uh, here we go. Uh, almost done with the content here. So we saw here's the orange thing. If that's the question. Oh, I think it's that, that thing on its leg right there. It looks like that's a pocket. Yeah. So so you would have emergency gear in all those pockets. So. Um, you'd have emer that might be an emergency oxygen supply bottle that gives you like 15 minutes of oxygen if you don't have the supply that see the supply line coming in from the spacecraft there. Um, so that way you would have uh, more that you could use. Uh, in the pockets, they usually have survival things like survival suit, knives, sunglasses, um, not the whole rack, but there would be a, some sort of survival flotation device built in. You can see under his armpit actually, or her armpit. There's a kind of a blue thing that's, it looks like that might be the floaty. They would also be wearing a parachute on top of all of this as well. So this is just the basic part of the spacesuit, but it does have more, more accessories, if you will. Okay, so uh, one last couple suits here. Uh, on the left are more suits by um, a company called ILC Dover. They're the ones who created the pressure suit for Apollo. Um, they were the Inter International Latex Corporation. Um, they made bras and were asked, hey, do you think you could make a spacesuit out of your materials? Because you, it's really difficult to actually um, not sew, but kind of hot glue these things together, if you will, uh, to make the right shapes for the suit. So ILC Dover has been involved with spacesuits since that era, uh, even before um, with their proposals, uh, but they had the Apollo pressure suit and so the X EMU or the EMU does, that NASA uses is actually the pressure suit part is actually still built by AILC, but this is another concept that they want to see walk on the moon one day. And then the black suit here uh, is also an IVA suit that's called the Soul, and uh, it also has a hoodie, so it's pretty cool. I mean, I think I want a space suit hoodie as well. Uh, on the, <laughs> Who doesn't on, want a space suit yeah. hoodie? Talk I, mean, a little I want bit. that. Yeah. I, I want to walk around in that, like I, you know, right now. Yeah. That would exactly. be pretty safe, right? Uh, yeah. Talk a little bit about why there's some different temper temperature things we need to consider, whether we're on the okay. moon or on Mars, because on Mars, it's warmer at our feet than at our head. I always think this is so fascinating how we have to think about a different, yeah. a slightly different suit for Mars than the moon. Right. Yeah. So um, there's so many things that we could go on for hours here, but I'll know, try, right? I'm trying to like boil down it to like, okay, what is the few major points? So for the IVA suits, again, the ones that are on the inside, um, all the cooling is done with air. Uh, so the air is actually control, the air is controlling the temperature of the spacecraft and of the spacesuit. It's something called the comfort box. They're trying to get the right range of temperature and the, actually the right range of humidity because if it's too dry, it's really hard to breathe. If it's too moist, then it's like, you know, it could get the equipment uh, wet and really bad for electronics, but it could also just be like way too much moisture in the air, bacteria could form. So you need to find the sweet spot of both humidity and temperature. Um, and then for these EVA suits, they actually have this under layer called the liquid cooling ventilation garment, another acronym, the LCVG. Um, and that circulates the water all over the body. So if you think of it as like, if, you, if your arm is super warm and hot because you're working really hard uh, and this cool water would actually kind of pass through the tubing all over your arm. Uh, the heat from your body, because it's in contact with that tube, would then uh, transfer into the water. So it's pulling the heat away from your body and pulling it away into the spacesuit life support uh, system to help reject that heat, get rid of that heat because it's an overload. Um, maybe one day we'll figure out how to use that heat, but right now we're just trying to get rid of it. Um, so that's how the cooling works. And then absolutely, if you've got a gravity environment, that means that what happens in with the gravity environment, you have two major things that you have to add in, right? Buoyancy and, uh, well, buoyancy essentially in gravity, because <laughs> I said gravity, and so heat rises. And so because heat rises, that also impacts how you have to design everything around your system. Um, again, we'll come back to more if there's more than that you want to know, but on the right there, there's actually a spacesuit being developed by India. So it's not just about US and Russia. There's a lot of countries that are trying to develop their own spacesuit. That one looks very familiar to the Russian spacesuit. And actually the Chinese spacesuit, both spacesuits, the IVA and the EVA spacesuits are um, from Russian design or an initiated as Russian design. Um, okay, so really briefly, just two or three slides about the things I do on campus with my lab. There's my cool logo that my students helped design um, and a whole bunch of spacesuits on the bottom. 
Um, so we, we've been testing this IVA spacesuit from Final Frontier Design. Um, we've, been, we've had like over 20 people in spacesuits on campus. So it's pretty exciting to think about where, you know, an undergraduate has their first semester doing their an, a university degree and they get to wear a real spacesuit for testing. And so we were looking at how does the spacesuit move around uh, in its cabin and we were actually using motion capture. So you can see all the glowing dots on the picture. Well, those are for the motion capture system to see how the body's moving. And so I have a little animation coming up and I'll show that to you. We've also worked with these analogs, these simulated Mars projects all over the world. Um, they have a range of different things from, you know, this really high fidelity one in the middle, the silver one, which is used by the Austrian Space Forum. Uh, they were in the Oman desert a few years ago, and they're going to be in Israel, hopefully, at the end of the year. Um, on the left is actually at the Mars Desert Research Station again with the kind of backpack helmet, and you, you know, you know, bring your own coveralls. And then on the right is actually a very old version of a, a spacesuit that was used at high seas in Hawaii. It's actually just a hazmat suit. You could probably use one of those right now because I'm running out. I ran out of ice cream. Um, so life without ice cream. I know that I. I should definitely not be complaining. Um, people have it really hard right now, but, um, I, and I'm curious about what do you guys miss? Um, and we can talk about that part of isolation later. Uh, so here's some spacesuits. Um, this is now the animation hopefully is working. This is what it looks like when you do motion capture, you capture all these different points. And so we're looking at how do the shoulders move? And so that just gives you an idea of what some of the data looks like. Um, right in the middle, I just want to draw your attention to like, there's something that has a bunch of measurements on it. So if you can see my mouse is, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but it's circling the first person. Um, if there's no spacesuit on, they're actually able to reach all the way over your head. And you can try this right now. You get everyone kind of like lifting their arms up and down. Try not to bend your elbows and just lift your arms all the way up. And I can see this is the hard part, right? Is that you need to have the right cameras to capture all of those arms going up and down. So most people can go all the way to 180 degrees. And now if you put on a spacesuit, even without putting pressure in it, you can only go out to like 90 degrees or a little bit higher because the fabric in the spacesuit is actually pulling down on the arm and keeping it from going any higher. Um, and then if you see the last of the three photos, they're actually are under pressure, there's pressure inside the spacesuit. Um, and it's slightly less, but overall there's other movements that they cannot do at all. Like they couldn't, they can actually reach across their body with their arm. Like if you take your shoulder and you swing it like nice and straight in front of you, uh, they couldn't reach across their body. They can only reach it just in front of them. So it's really important on where do you design the spacecraft to have the right buttons. Um, so if there's an emergency and their, their spacesuit is being used, they need to be able to touch things. So for the most part, most spacesuits are not uh, pressurized when they launch. They're on, uh, there is airflow. Uh, but it's the same pressure as the cabin. So it's comfortable. It's not like it's, um, it's not like you're fighting against a balloon um, where when you're in space, there's a vacuum around you. So you are fighting against the balloon. So the pressure differential is what it's called is really important. Like how much are you actually uh, moving against? Okay, so I think I have just one more. Um, we'll find out. I think there's just one more. It's having a little bit of a heart attack. Um, so, uh, <laughs> So this, I actually meant to, I did edit this slide. Um, there's, there was a link on it, but our, our lab, you can see our lab here, ERAU Space, our Suit Lab. Uh, we have a YouTube channel and we actually have a whole bunch of these videos on it. I'm just gonna hit play on all of them because these are all called time-lapse videos. They were just to have a reference so we could go back and look at all our spacesuit testing. So you can see on the far right, the three kind of tests this is a very early version of the lab before we had the, the better motion capture setup, um, but it was just our, our, one of our first tests that we ever did. And so you can see the spacesuits like bulking up and everything. And uh, my students make really cool videos too. So you should check those out of all the projects that they work on. All right, let's see if I can go to the next one. All right, so that's, I'm gonna stop sharing there. Actually, I won't stop sharing yet because there might be some questions. Actually, I'll just stop sharing. So we can, I wanna see everyone. <laughs> Um, Everybody, if you people. feel Hi, go to gallery view, and yeah. then that way we can see each other. There was one question from yeah. Facebook online: Does a white color, or does the white color of a spacesuit reflect any gamma radiation? Ooh. Um, so uh, you're, we're gonna have to like call up a friend, right, on this one. Call right. your, your radiation <laughs> That's specialist. That's a brilliant question. Yeah. So um, really, I was talking about more of the visible light that impacts the heating. Um, so in terms of radiation, you really need other layers to deal with radiation. 
Um, so keep that in mind that all everything to do with the space environment. So temperature, um, radiation, um, the vacuum, all these things, all these different parts, you have to protect the astronaut. So that means there's got to be a special layer to do those special things. I'm going to, so, uh, yeah. So, so guys, if you've got questions, I want you to think about what your questions are and you can just do this right here and we'll go around and call on you now there are about 30 of us so just be patient as we come around but mm -hmm. let's see here uh coming to you down here uh you got a bunch of footballs for your name i see you've got a blue shirt what is your name you're standing up did you want to ask a question you right there maybe not all right so lucas i see you what's your question What's that, baby? My question is, when we go to Mars, what kind of spacesuit do you think we'll need? So what kind of what Mars spacesuit do we need? Mm -hmm. um, so we need one that can walk, first of all, like so in terms of the design. It has to do all the, all the things about keeping the astronaut alive and safe. Um, we want it to be able to function and do the job. So it has to walk. You have to be able to like bend down and take rock samples. Um, you need to have good visibility. So it's really important to make a really good helmet. Um, with that helmet, you could even have a heads up display or augmented reality. Uh, that's something that um, some of my students are working on is some augmented reality. So you get the astronauts can get information um, about how, how they're doing, even things like, so I'm wearing like a, um, a biometric watch that tells me my heart rate and steps and all that fun stuff. Well, right now, the astronauts actually don't know uh, their own information when they're out on EVA on the space station because they have mission, mission control right next door to them that can tell them, hey, your heart rate's looking pretty high. They, they have somebody else that can watch it for them. But when we're on Mars, there's going to be a 10 to 20 minute delay each way, meaning that you can't wait for someone to say, hey, 20 minutes ago, your heart rate was high. You need to be able to monitor yourself. So I think that'll be in the future spacesuits is that we'll see astronauts with the capability of actually seeing how their body's doing. Um, for me, I think that's important too. Like I mean, every now and then I'm like, oh, I wonder what my heart rate is. Um, I'm working pretty hard here. I wanna know what kind of you know, workout I'm getting out of this. So um, the other part of that is that uh, I've asked astronauts about this and they, they've said that basically they're so used to doing uh, exercise and EVA and all their activities that they actually know when their body is working too hard. Like, I mean, you can feel it too, right? Your heart's pumping away. And so they actually slow down um, how hard they're working to kind of pace themselves because uh, most of these EVAs on space station uh, last from six to eight hours. So imagine, you know, working out in the garden, um, playing, doing things physically for like pretty much all day and only having like uh, 32 ounces, I think, of water. So they have like a little squeezy bag. Oh, that looks cool. My water's floating. In space. <laughs> um, they have a little squeezy drink bag inside their spacesuit right here with a little straw. And they're like, um, and, they, and they don't even have food. Like they have granola bars and things before they go out on EVA. Um, but they don't, you know, maybe one day they'll have like a sport. They do like, they can make a sport drink mix, but maybe they'll have like also, you know, another feeding tube of, so they got the water and the tube and they can eat and drink and do all those things that they need to do. Um, and you guys, here is a bonus question and you can email it to me. Does anybody know who was out for the longest spacewalk EVA ever? You might be surprised. So that is part of your homework. So write that down. And I want you guys letting me know what you find. All right, I'm coming around. Uh, let's see, Ander, I see you. Also, no, no, Alex, I wanted to unmute you. You had a great question. Maybe Andrew, just like a 40 pound one. Wouldn't that be better? So, so ask that question because you had a couple of different questions here. So, Alex? I heard 40 pounds. <laughs> yeah, well, he wanted to, uh, Alex's question was how many times can a spacesuit be reused? And then yeah. Ander will come to you next. So um, right now, uh, depending on what it is, uh, hopefully a lot, but the ones on space station um, were designed to only have a lifetime of 15 years and now it's been 30 years or more. And so um, they're, they're way overdue and they've done, uh, that's why I said they're pretty amazing. Like they've still done a lot of work. Um, so most spacesuits are designed for about 10 times 
And the ones that they use for launching humans are custom right now. So they're really only one time use. Um, that's understandable, um, but we can get to a point of having better reusability because they're expensive. Maybe we can reuse parts and uh, use those for future suits. Um, the ones that will be on the moon, especially, are going to get really torn up. So we really need to have kind of like an outer layer that we're okay with saying, okay, it's not garbage, but it can't be used as a safety garment. We have to use it for something else. Maybe it can be repurposed into some other object. Um, but the suits really need to last long. The Apollo suits were only designed for three uses, three times. Um, their EVAs were uh, four to six hours, so they weren't very long. Um, and so that's something we need to do a better job of having suits last a long time, because especially when we go to Mars, it's not just next door. The moon takes three days to get to, that's still not that close, but uh, Mars takes six to eight months if things are aligned properly. And so unless you have a giant pile of spacesuits that were launched on their own rocket, um, it's a lot of stuff to launch. So we need to make sure they last a very long time. Fantastic. Uh, Andrew, we're going to come to you and then we're going to answer Amy's uh, online questions. So Andrew, where are you, my dear? There you are. What's your question? Um, so I have two questions. Um, first one is, has have you ever like made a spacesuit? Um, the short answer is no, um, but I've made a lot of uh, I've, I've, fixed, I've repaired a lot of simulated spacesuits and I've made a whole bunch of different types of costumes for different events, um, but I've never made a spacesuit. I, I mostly like to test and break things. So I like to figure out what can make them better and safer. That's really like, I'm really a testing kind of engineer. Um, and uh, I like to design things too. So um, I don't really have any good doodles. I think I just doodled something with my daughter on the on a piece of paper and it's kind of yeah my students drawings are way better than that so <laughs> what's your you second, second question? question and yeah. my second question is um what's your favorite spacesuit that you've ever seen yeah uh great question um i like a lot of i like them all they're spacesuits but um <laughs> i really like the mercury spacesuits the original ones because they were like cool and silver and I think like that kind of bridges the the gap between like sci-fi and uh, reality because it's like this like kind of cool looking spacesuit. It's very inspiring. Um, if you go to Mercury Seven, even if you go to the Wikipedia page, I don't usually recommend. You know, I recommend usually like uh, cool. So like uh, I love Wikipedia, but I should always look for the real photo, the original photos. But you can at least find it there. So look Mercury Seven, and you'll find their spacesuits. Um, I actually here. I'll I'll jump one ahead. I'm like uh, I got to be like a DJ here, right? Um, on the <laughs> computer, so I can right. help people. Because I when I work with my students, my students are all university students. Um, I have a lot of chats like this, but this is really cool, by the way, because I actually can see you all. And a lot of the times they turn off their video, and I don't even know if they're there or not. Um, so there's a link in the chat uh, to the Mercury Seven. You can see the silver spacesuit. I think that's really cool. That's very cool. Hey, we've got a question from online with Amy Massetta. Uh, mm -hmm. She says, what type of degree or how many years do you need to work in your field? Um, you know, is that, you know, you've spent a while attaining your PhD and uh, you, yeah. you may have many other degrees. Yeah, um, so the question, I'm gonna throw the question back the other way saying like, what do you wanna work on? What do you wanna do? Um, I happen to be an engineer, but there are so many things, roles that are needed for space exploration that it just depends on how much studying and time you want to do um, before finding or finding what you, um, I guess you could say what your dream job might be. Um, my degree, so I have an undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering I, from the Queen's University in Canada. I have a um, uh, master's of space studies from the International Space University in France a master's of aerospace engineering from Penn State University and a PhD in aerospace engineering sciences from the University of Colorado at Boulder. So I zigzagging all over the place. Um, and so I spent a lot of time in school because I really enjoy research. And those were some of the only ways of having opportunities to do human spaceflight research because most places are, they might be building that one thing um, or you know advancing technology in one or two things. And so, I wasn't, I, I don't know the right way of saying it, but um, 
at this point in my career, I really want to learn as much as I could. And so um, that's really what motivated me to be involved with school, not necessarily just getting a degree, but it was the topics and the opportunities that just happened to come up. So timing, uh, timing is everything. You have to be a little bit lucky too on what things, opportunities might open up for you. So if you're really into like marine biology, then, you know, be a marine biologist. Don't worry about um, what other people are, might be studying. You should focus on the things that, you know, spark joy for you and that you're passionate about and follow those interests. Um, I don't know how many- Some of those interests yeah. will be, uh, some of those interests will be kind of intertwined. So yeah. if you're interested in, you know, engineering and building and breaking yeah. things and then figuring out how <laughs> to fix them, that's one vertical. If you're also interested in like the geology or planetary science, that's another vertical, mm -hmm. especially for folks your age. Now is the perfect time to be a self-taught and figure out as much as you like and go, wow, this is the thing that really gets me kind of spinning excitedly on my axis, you know? So uh, I just encourage, it's like, for me, when I look back at my bachelor's degree, I, I, I love music and theater and, but have a minor in science. So there's multiple ways that as you grow, so will yeah. like, I, I do way more science now than I do music and theater. So I think there's ways that your many interests can meld uh, into all of the things that you love. So never be afraid to study as much as possible as Dr. Ryan was talking about. Let me go and see. I see your hand over here, uh, T and Celeste. All right, what's your question? Oh, I got several questions over here. What's your questions, girls? Uh, we have two questions. My question is, um, are the suits washable? And if so, what's the procedures for that? And you? Have have they made suits for pets yet? <laughs> oh, yeah. So, I love that. Um, so uh, for let, let's let's not talk about pets, but let's talk about uh, animal explorers. Um, the very first creatures that launched into space were dogs with Russia, and they had spacesuits. They had little spacesuits for the dogs, and it wasn't to go float around in space and like you know find a fire hydrant to pee on or whatever. It was so that they could keep them safe inside of the spacecraft. So they were the IVA suits, right? Um, and the, uh, unfortunately the first, the first, does anyone know the name of the first dog in space? A little trivia question. Laika. Um, yeah, Laika. So Laika is the first dog in space. Unfortunately, Laika was kind of on a one-way voyage. Um, and, but the, the other dogs that followed Laika actually returned safely and they had little dog spacesuits on. Um, so you should definitely look up Laika and dog spacesuits and you'll find some, some, uh, some cool things. I actually got to see um, uh, some of those spacesuits when I was visiting Russia, like way back. And um, they're awesome. Like I kind of want, I'd almost rather have a little dog spacesuit to play with than my own spacesuit. But um, so, there, so there have been animals in space with spacesuits. Um, other animals are mostly going up to space station um, for seeing how they grow and live in space. Um, so they're not really, they're inside the space station, so they don't really need a spacesuit. But I'm sure you guys could draw uh, and design amazing animal spacesuits. Um, so the other question about washing them. So um, yes, they need to maintain them so that they're able to go out again and again and again. And so they have to make sure things like um, the different seals, like where the glove would connect to the, the upper body parts, um, would, that those are nice and clean and that they have to make sure that uh, all the air hoses and everything else are, are, are maintained. Um, so it's not like you could, um, what, you can't even wash yourself in space really. All you can use is wet wipes and some like no rinse shampoo in your hair and, and some, a little bit of water. So the same thing with the spacesuits, all they can really use is wipes and, um, you know, it's not like they're getting that dirty though if they're in microgravity. If they're on the moon though, what they had to do is they actually had these brushes that they use to try to brush off as much dust as possible before coming into the lunar lander. But guess what? They still brought a ton of dust on, into the inside. Um, the astronauts said that they actually had like hay fever type symptoms and that their sinuses were all messed up because the dust was getting into the cabin air. Um, so this is something that we have to really figure out. Um, I'm for having some sort of what I call a dirty airlock, meaning 
you come in, it's like a mud room. Um, some people, does anyone have a mud room or a snow room at their house where it's like uh, a front entrance way, but it, then there's another doorway? <laughs> no, yeah, I see Dharma has her hand up. Um, yeah, so there's places, especially up north, like where I grew up in Canada, not at my house where I grew up, but there are places where you have like a double entrance way where you go in and you knock off your boots, the, either the dirt, the snow, whatever, uh, and you clean yourself up there. Um, and, and then you come into the kind of living space. And so we actually have like an airlock in a bunch of these Mars simulations that I've been involved in. Um, let me just see if we can go for the, let's go for a bonus photo, right? Um, <laughs> you need to be bonus photo time. Uh, well, it's a cool photo, so I'll show it, but it, it doesn't actually show like the room. The room is very small. Let's take a look, share screen, this, 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 and there you go. That's a, a look inside of the airlock as we're putting on our simulated spacesuits. Um, so it's just basically this small room. And then there's an actual airlock. So there's like the airlock where you get pressurized or depressurized to go on the surface. And then there's this like muddy, it's not the muddy room. It's more like the in-between room because the airlock's really where you can clean yourself up after you do it outside a little bit. So you have to keep as much as possible, keep all the dust out of the habitat. And so I've done research on that as well. So I have a lot of cool photos we didn't get to, but again, that could be part two, I guess. Definitely part two. So yeah. I'm gonna unmute Hashim. Where are you, my dear? You had a question. All the way from Pakistan. Uh, cool. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna forecast, let's see. Can you help me unmute yourself there? Ah, oh, there you go. All right, so Hashim, I believe he's gonna be the person that starts the space agency there. So Hashim, nice. your future space agency, be thinking of its name. Ask your question, my dear. How many attempts did it take to get the first space suit just right? Oh, good question. Um, well, uh, that, that's almost like um, a little bit of unwritten history because well, the, what, who, is, who is the very first astronaut in space or not astronaut? Take our room on trivia question. Who's the very <laughs> first human in space? Oh, I see. I think a couple hands up. Oh, let's see. Uh, Jack Grippo over here. Who's the first person in space? Alan Shepard. Oh, no. All right. Who's got it? Let's see. Anybody else? Do I see a hand anywhere? Come on. Hashim, do you know? Okay. I'm coming over here to Hashim. I think I saw your face first. Mm. Who is the first person in space? All right, who is it? Neil Armstrong. No, oh goodness, this is a great moment for you, Ryan. You can help us. Okay, let's see if Ander has it. All right, Ander. Is it first? Yuki Gagarian? Yuri Gagarian. Yuri Gagarian. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So Yuri Gagarin, first human in space. Um, and guess what? He launched uh, just a few days ago um, in history on April 12th, 1961. Um, so next year we'll be celebrating the 60th anniversary of Yuri. Um, and so Yuri, Yuri being the first human in space means there's the first spacesuit in space. Um, and so there's no, not a lot of history on, there's a little bit, but there's not a lot of history on the development. It was more like, you know, we're going to test this in a vacuum chamber. We're going to, you know, put some air into it and shove it underwater and see if it has any leaks. Um, but they really had to get it right, right away. Um, so a lot of these things are kind of tested very minimally before uh, they were flown. Now, uh, a lot of things that are flown in space are tested for a very long time to make sure they meet all the standards that we've learned to develop because there were no standards yet. No one knew what was needed. And now we know what we need. Um, and so we have ways of testing those things. Oh, Janet, you're muted. So Tapa Swinney, it's like, let me see, where are you? You've got a question about uh, Mars and spacesuits. Go ahead, my sweet. Uh, I actually have three questions. Okay. Uh, my first question would be that uh, astronauts are generally very active. So how do they feel about the restricted movements while wearing a space suit? Okay, should we do one at a time, I guess, just so I don't forget them all? Um, yeah. So um, it's something they learn and they're trained how to work with. Um, they spend hours and hours and hours in uh, the neutral buoyancy laboratory, which is a giant, the world's largest pool, indoor pool um, that has a, almost a full-size space station uh, mock-up 
down below. I think it's only the it's only half of it. It's only the, the U.S. portion. Um, but I got to visit that with my students last year, and it's huge. It's very impressive. Um, so you should check out videos for the NBL. Um, and so they train. I think they uh, one of the astronauts said that they train 10 hours for every hour they spend um, on EVA. So if an astronaut has one EVA, it's usually eight hours. So that means they spend 80 hours preparing for that one EVA. And a lot of them will do two or three during their six months in space. And so there's already 250 hours, 240 hours that they're spending underwater to train. And so they get, they understand uh, what the suit can do and, and can't do approximately. I mean, it's not a perfect uh, simulation because you are fighting a little bit against water, but it is designed so that the, the amount of um, uh, viscosity of the water that you're fighting against and the pressure of the suit is about equal to what it would be if you were just wearing the space suit in the vacuum of space. So they spend a lot of time uh, getting used to it. And there's actually a lot of injuries that occur too. Like you get shoulder injuries um, and other things like fingernail dilapidation, which means you're like your fingernails start to fall apart because your hands are getting basically too saturated from the water and, and the rubbing against the gloves because you're like this the whole time, right? So in space and microgravity, this is how you walk. You use your hands. You grab things, you move yourself along, you untether, click in, click out. Um, you do all your tools with your hands. Your legs, they're useless in microgravity. They just float with you. You don't even need legs in your spacesuit. That's always surprising when I see like legs on a spacesuit in microgravity. It's like, you could have just had a sleeping bag looking thing. As long as you could hook it into the Canada arm to be moved around, it could have just looked like a little boot lip with um, a sleeping bag. Um, and so uh, they spend a lot of time um, training and that's the, the big part of how to get used to them. But that doesn't, that means that the suits can improve and they can be better fit. Um, they have, they've working on the shoulder bearings used to be like, kind of like straight. They're actually angling them now or so more arm, more arm sizes can fit in these things. Like, especially, um, the, on the smaller range, because it's really painful to have that hard piece touching your shoulder over and over. Okay. I know you had two more questions. So I'll, Maybe we can get to those. Yeah, so uh, Tapa Swinney, ask your other question, and then we're going to end yeah. with Judah and Rory, and okay. then we'll conclude our time together. So what was your other Perfect. question? Um, it was that uh, spacesuits usually uh, reflect all the thermal radiation, but what happens to the small percentage which is not reflected back? Um, oh, yeah, I, I heard the question. I'm just trying to, like, compute. Uh, the question itself. Um, so you said that it reflects some of the rate. What happens to the radiation that doesn't reflect back? Is it what you're asking? I think so. Yeah. yeah. Um, depending on the type of radiation, um, it would be absorbed. I mean, if it's uh, particles that could actually pass through materials too, uh, there's some radiation that is at such a uh, wavelength that can actually go right through almost most materials. So. Uh, astronauts still experience a radiation dose. Um, it's a lot higher, obviously, than it would be if you were on the surface, um, the, sorry, the surface of Earth. Um, even in low Earth orbit, they have a, a pretty large dose. And because of that, there's actually an amount, like a, a safety limit that uh, different space agencies are okay with people working in space um, for their accumulated dose, because it's kind of like you keep getting this dosage a little bit more and more. So pilots who fly airplanes actually get way more radiation dosage than we do on the, on the planet. And so up in the air, they actually have limits as well. And so for going all the way to the moon, we're actually leaving the protection of our magnetic field in, in low Earth orbit from the Van Allen belts. We're actually uh, at the potential of getting a lot more radiation. Same with Mars, because we don't have that protection of a magnetic field. Great question. It's, it's, there's a lot more to it, I'm sure. That we could get into, but I know we have two more. We need to two more questions, and I want to be respectful of your time, sir. So, Judah, I'm going to come to you, and then Rory, you're going to end our class today with the last question. I know you guys have got others. If you want to send those to me, we'll talk about that after we let Dr. Ryan go. Judah, what's your question? So, I live in Huntsville, Alabama. Have you ever been to the Space and Rocket Center? Yeah, that's my photo in the background that I took of Huntsville. Like my uh, my the photo behind me here, you might recognize those spacesuits. Those are actually spacesuits that are on display, or they were on display uh, in Huntsville. Um, so I've been there only once. Uh, I'd love to visit it again one day. Um, but I got to 
see uh, all the cool things, the Rock Garden and, and uh, Education Center. Um, and I actually got to go on site. Um, I think it's called Building One, um, where Von Braun's office used to be. Uh, and I got to see some of the test stands where they where they test all the rockets. So really cool area to visit. Huntsville's really a really cool city too. All right. I have Rory, a t-shirt somewhere too. <laughs> coming to you, Rory. What's your question? What is the strongest space suit? The strongest space suit? Um, that, I, I don't even know how to answer that. That's a great question. Um, because um, the, the strength of a suit um, is not really measured the same way as uh, I guess you could say the strength of um, a piece of metal or something. Because the amount of stress that some of the inner layers like this balloon layer that's underneath that experience that stretching, that's where the strength is. Um, so the suits themselves, um, I guess overall, they have to, all the, all the materials, especially the lower materials have to be extremely strong to maintain all that pressure. Does that help answer the question? I hope it does, but so it's, it's really about the layers, not the suits. And guys, it's, uh, we're coming up against time. Dr. Ryan has some other amazing things he's doing this morning, which he's gonna to talk to his own college class here soon. Yeah. Mainly, thank you, Dr. Ryan Kobrick. So amazing. And yes, I will probably invite you back here <laughs> in a week or two. There's so much to cover. Yeah. So here is what I've come up with for a design challenge. And remember, oh. all of this is always volunteer. Again, you won't be graded on it, but I'm gonna ask a favor of your students, Dr. Kobrick, if you could do this. So here's the challenge, guys. I want you to do your research. That's where every good scientist begins. I want you to ask a question. If I was going to build my own spacesuit to go to the moon or Mars, yeah. what do I need? Then you're going to do your research. Then I want you to maybe draw out that prototype or who knows if you've got a, if you're a good person who can sew it, maybe you want to, uh, you know, it's like, Ander, you had a great one last year at space camp that you made. Oh, I'm look at there. That. Oh, nice. Draw your spacesuit. We're on the same page, I tell you. Yeah. So if you draw your <laughs> spacesuit, but I'm going to go a step further. You guys are capable of doing a bit of good research. And then we will send those to Dr. Kobrick. And maybe you could talk about some of the things these 8, 9, 10, 11 year old, 12, uh, they're all the way from kind of 7 to 17 on this call. Yeah. And see if your students would go, I could have had a V8. We didn't think about that. Or, oh my gosh, that is lining up with my PhD thesis of how to build a spacesuit. All yeah. right. So Sounds there good. is our challenge. I'm going to unmute everybody so you can say thank you to Dr. Kobrick. Everybody thank say you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Tomorrow. Thanks thank you, you. Janet. Janet, uh -huh. I'm like, um, um, a six to seventeen. Bye. That's right. You are still okay, sick. You. you know what? I always think you're seven there, Lucas. All right, guys. <laughs> but I am holding something about a month or so. We're gonna celebrate Bye. your birthday online then. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 What was? Bye. I gotta go. See you later. Bye. Hopefully, we finally get off of this. Uh, this is this is so awkward.